Service Lab is a community of service design doers and the service design curious. We meet up every few months to share our learnings with each other. First speaker tonight is Matteo Remondini, that is uh, currently a service designer for IDEAN. And tonight is going to give, give us a, pre a personal presentation of uh, his insights on how designers contribute in a non-social design environment. So Matteo, you should be able to share your screen so I can just pass yep. it over to you. Thank you, um, everyone, first of all, to be here and you guys for organizing as usual. Uh, it's always a pleasure. So um, my name is Matteo. Um, I'm service designer at IDN, a global design studio. And today I will first ask you to do a short experiment with me and then I'll share a few personal and um, professional stories, I would say, going through some of the reasons why I genuinely care about designing for good um, while sharing some reflections uh, on the topic uh, with you all. Um, I'm really keen to hear your thoughts as well, so um, it'd be great to open up the discussion a little bit uh, at the end uh, for anyone willing to uh, share their ideas, if that's okay. Cool. Um, okay, let's begin with a little um, experiment. I'd like to ask you uh, to close your eyes and um, imagine an island. So you're on the beach uh, on a late afternoon. Um, it's summer and the sun is coming down. Uh, the sea is calm, but a gentle breeze comes from behind you. There's only a couple of people left. Um, they are still swimming. And as you observe them, you can smell grilled fish and you can tell it's fresh which makes you feel a bit peckish. Perfect, you can open your eyes now. Uh, we'll come back to this image a little bit later on. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with a personal story from, um, from a few years ago. Um, as a kid, I grew up in a council estate in Giambellino, a relatively small area in the suburbs of Milan, Italy. Uh, Giambellino uh, was historically known for being a bit rough and um, as many of these suburbs, not very full of opportunities, I would say. Uh, one morning when I was about seven years old, um, one of the kids that I used to play football with um, disappeared. The next day, uh, we found out that social services took him away from his parents uh, because at school he opened up about the abuse he was suffering from. Um, a few years later, uh, while I was in my bedroom, probably watching the Scraps TV series, um, I heard some, some people screaming. Um, so I got out and basically the building right in front of mine was burning. Um, we later heard that it was set on fire by the local mafia. And while the fire brigades managed to contain the damage, the family living there had to go and live somewhere else. Um, so a few years and quite a few dramas, I'd say later, um, I was offered a job at Shelter, the housing charity. And in all honesty, right until I got the job, I thought that Shelter was only um, helping people sleeping in the street. Uh, at the end of the day, that's what we often think when um, that, that happens when we support an homelessness charity. It turns out that while Shelter does help people sleeping rough, um, that's not why it's considered to be um, the best way to solve the problem. Many are, in fact, of the opinion that campaigning for policy change would be way more effective. So Shelter prioritizes that. And that's when I kind of learned my first uh, lesson, um, that what sometimes seems to be making an impact uh, might be actually considered counterproductive by others. Um, even within charitable organization, there's always a number of different competing priorities, which makes it hard to decide where to focus efforts and um, limited resources on. So um, have a think, if, if you were given the possibility to choose, would you try to fix the long, long-term complex problem or instead focus on actually solving the immediate clear issue? Anyway, um, 
as part of the sort of onboarding process, all staff members at Shelter are required to spend at least a day um, shadowing a um, help uh, session by one uh, housing advisor. Um, I'm, I'm aware that this is a process in place in a number of other charities, which is great. Um, the number of stories that I've had listened to uh, of um, people that were about to be evicted, uh, maybe because they felt into debt or perhaps dealing with mental health issues or while being in an unsafe relationship or perhaps all of the above uh, together. It's, it's really, really hard, if not impossible, to not empath empathize with somebody struggling. And perhaps even more if you grew up uh, in a bit of a rough context yourself. And um, the people around you, often your close friends, have been through something like that. It kind of makes you want to do something to help towards what or in which way might not be that clear, but you just feel like doing something uh, meaningful. Um, and I was talking about shelter to a friend of mine um, who was employed at Bloomberg at the time. As I described him the help calls I listened in, um, he looked at me with a very surprised face, shocked to learn that not all British people are as wealthy as the clients that he dealt with daily. He simply did never come across a person, say, living on a minimum wage. And that's the second thing that I've learned. I think many people are simply not aware. They actually don't know what it is like to say having abusive parents or not having a safe place to live in, or even just not having a steady income because they've never met somebody in these conditions. And so it's useful to remind ourselves that these who surround us all have had very different life experiences from ours. A few months later, um, I met a lady who works for a service design agency and uh, she shared her thoughts about the work that she was doing. She felt like, although she, she was, she felt lucky to be working in the social design space. Uh, however, most of the stuff that she was doing didn't seem to go anywhere. It's like all the agency work, she, she said to me. Once you're out, nobody really will care about that work anymore. Neither your agency will, nor the client. And that not only seemed a bit sad, but um, it also didn't seem to match with my experience with some work uh, that a design agency had done for Shelter uh, earlier that year. Although their work wasn't as deep as some of the projects that we've actually done in that problem space. Um, it actually gave our team, my team an opportunity to look at the problem from a very different angle. And we ended up actually replicating a few uh, core parts of the idea on a digital solution that is finally be built, uh, being built right now, a few years later. Um, I've now left shelter. And uh, recently with IDN, um, I've been lucky enough to work alongside an amazing team on a large project for an healthcare provider. And we all know that healthcare often comes with a big loads of questions, but um, I'm not here today to talk about the problems. And I know it's gonna sound quite cheesy, but honestly, if you could hear the broken voice of the doctor that we've interviewed when he told us how they lost a very young patient to cancer, or when another doctor described us how thankful her patients in uh, developing countries are. When these incredibly poor people tell her, you saved my life, um, she remembers why she decided to be a doctor in the first place. And this is the third thing I learned. Um, some people might think that a specific sector is all good or bad. Some say in-house work is slow, uh, others that commercial work is just evil or that government work is good or, or bad according to who you ask. And although that can require some effort, it's useful to keep reminding ourselves that the world is not just black and white. In agency, we might propose some ideas that end up being implemented by the client uh, years later, or we could leverage our role in a for-profit organization to nudge it, to operate more sustainably. Even a project for a questionable client might provide us with great learning experiences. But 
that comes with a caveat, which leads me to the fourth learning. Like this optimistic outlook doesn't mean that everything that shines as good is necessarily well and good. Like what this means is that we simply cannot anticipate how far our actions can go. We can't predict how the world will be in a few years time, possibly months, a week. Um, we can only live in the present, uh, perhaps following some rules to stick to. Um, what I've learned is that sort of defining some personal principles and um, sort of intentions up front can really help us when we are not that sure whether we are, what we're doing is kind of good or bad for us. What kind of things are we definitely going to say no to no matter what, or if, if we are in a role which seems not aligned with our values, uh, what's the ultimate reason of being where we are? What are we working towards on the long run? Remember that so many of us are now questioning their role in society, way more than just a few years ago. And this meetup testifies it. Bloomberg talking about uh, degrowth testifies it and in, in a sort of uncertain and fast changing world where as individuals and as a society, we are redefining our own principles. I personally found that getting familiar with humanist studies um, can help. Fields of psychology, sociology, philosophy, you name it. Uh, they can all tell us a great deal about how humans operate and what kind of principles they have followed over time, which perhaps we can use to leverage our unique role of designers or whatever role we are in, in whatever context we find ourselves in. Finally, you might simply not be employed at the moment. If you have some spare time and you feel like contributing while uh, sort of building portfolio, uh, perhaps start by breaking down what are the problems um, that are sort of closer to you. Um, the next step would be to really research that problem and uh, to find out what are the root causes and sort of who's going, who's doing something already in that, uh, in that space. You likely find that a huge amount of solutions have already been tried. But uh, I'd say don't give up. If you can define your own values, uh, your own intentions, and sort of be clear about your skill set, it'll actually be easier to find the gap and to apply your unique lens to it. Um, for instance, I personally uh, feel that as designers, we can do a lot just by simplifying and sort of making accessible the enormous amount of information that is out there. Um, as an example, I love this intervention tool by the Center for Homelessness Impact, um, which allows people working on housing policy to make more confident decisions um, using the best available evidence for homelessness interventions. And although this, um, this wasn't a personal project, and I believe it's still in a way work in progress, but what is stopping you to try and create something similar for the stuff that you care about? So just to recap, um, first point, it's kind of, it's hard to decide what's most impactful and social impact in a way is a prof proxy for defining good. Uh, we have not been able in centuries to define, um, you know, to agree on what that means. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that even the third sector can, strug can struggle to decide that. Second one, um, some people might have never experienced what you have. Um, this also works when communicating research uh, insights in, um, in our day-to-day -day, uh, work. Using rich stories, videos, and real quote can really help stimulating empathy. Um, third one, the, the world is not just black and white and research shows that we are really bad at predicting the future. Um, so time can often broaden our perspectives and the results of our actions might be very different from what we uh, sort of initially had in mind. However, to try and help our to the decision making, setting some personal guidelines and or intention might really help. Um, that's what we often do for clients when we help them defining their service principle or the brand's values. And fifth one, if you have some spare time to invest into trying something new, strive for purpose. Right? In, in such an overcrowded world, 
understanding uh, what we care about and what we can offer uh, can help finding our own market fit. Um, so um, before we go, I'd like you to do um, classic um, Mentimeter one simple uh, question survey. Um, this is just an experiment really to so to find out how many people could actually see the beach that we talked about earlier. So if you don't mind heading to um, menti.com on your device and enter the code that you see on the screen. So it's 75, 96, 43, um, three. I'm gonna give you um, a second. And in the meantime, I'm gonna swap screen um, to the actual results. So, um, oh, good, we can see um, we got some answers already. So the question was, how well could you picture um, the image of the beach in your mind? Um, interesting. So I can see there is no one actually couldn't see it at all. Five could see some parts of it. Um, eight people could actually see colors and shape. Nine people now. now. Six people felt like I was there. I'm quite jealous, I have to say. Seven. Okay, that's that's an interesting one. Okay, let me go back um, to where I was. So um, some people are actually, including me, I found out, are unable to bring an image to mind, um, even of familiar places or family members. Um, scientists refer um, to this inability as aphantasia or aphantasia. Um, whereas other people with mild uh, synesthesia instead associate days of the weeks of the week or numbers to specific colors, probably some of you uh, as well, and they generally believe that everybody does the same. This is all just to add that although we all live in the same reality, we perceive things differently. And when people can be hard to understand. Remembering that we all physically see the world differently can help uh, putting things in perspective. Also, this little experiment might have a additional, an additional benefit. Sometimes trying to save the world from itself can get a bit stressful. Um, so there's nothing new here, but imagining our own little island in the sunset with a breeze and anything else you'd love to have um, can help us chill out a bit. So yeah, sometimes just doing something good for the world simply starts with doing something good for ourselves. That's it. Um, really curious to hear your thoughts. So if you'd rather message me separately, um, you can find me lurking on Twitter. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Matteo. Uh, a, a virtual, a virtual club. Uh, it was great. Uh, thank you for sharing your personal story as well as your experience and is, is not always easy to kind of like draw from like personal life to insights and, and sharing that. I think it's great. Um, I can see as well, like some, you know, so, uh, comments about how, how are these degree on what social impact is and so on. Um, I do actually have a question if, if it's okay. Um, in, in the meantime, is that everyone have any other question you can also put in the chat. Um, so I was wondering uh, the last, the last slide was about perceiving uh, things in a different way. Um, and I was wondering, what do you think that you perceive, maybe it's a bit too abstract, but what do you think that you perceive differently after having working like social design? Um, physically, not much different in the sense that I wasn't able to imagine, <laughs> imagine that beach before. Uh, now it's the same. Um, it's quite a complex one. And I tried to summarize my thoughts in this presentation just because the, how to say that, I think the, the main outcome, really, the main, the main point is that even though I've not, um, I've been kind of really passionate about this kind of stuff for a long time, um, even after working in a third sector, I'm still not sure I kind of, I kind of know what is best. So it's, I don't have the answers, basically. I can just have reflections. I can um, tell you what I've kind of investigated over time for years, thinking about this kind of stuff. And um, 
there is a bunch of uh, of people obviously out there that have been spending time as well so looking at the uh, measurement for social impact uh, there is there's like people that for decades have been trying to come up with frameworks uh, and then you've got the third sector so charities that trying to apply some of these frameworks to identify if what they do is good or not good um my perception is simply changed in the sense that it was simplistic to begin with i thought that was going to be it but over time i realized that it's not as simple great um there are also some comments that kind of that kind of agree with what you were what you were saying as well as uh, kind of like seeing how then that that's why it's also important human center design and related to this is a question that ask so given that people do see things differently have different experiences and so on what do you think of the people making the decisions versus the people being helped for example the people making decisions tend to not be the people being helped um absolutely that's um the the point about sort of sharing um as much as possible visuals and rich stories and real quotes um that is like it's something at least in my experience has proven to be extremely useful with decision makers because quite often and these could be politicians could be high level managers these people might simply not not be bad people but they might just not being exposed they they don't empathize with some of the things that uh, the users actually experience um so conveying somebody the end users sort of experience through something that really stimulates empathy that often is like more powerful than any uh, data or um, any other sort of uh, numbers and such great thank you matteo and um, there are other comments they kind of agree with with this comment as well as with this whole idea of like the importance of involving users um there is just one last question and then we can move move, move on but i think it would be great to hear your opinion on how do you usually explain social impact to people i have no clue about that i i wish i had an answer um i can see though there's a few comments like about um beyond the human centered design so um i guess there's there's a bunch of uh, academics or like people that have been thinking about this for way longer than us and have been researching it quite a lot so we are not like we we our focusing is in somewhere else, i suppose um but um i was lucky enough to be in a very draining four hours philosophy talk uh, at politecnico di milano was it about i don't know a few months ago when when still in in person meetings were a thing and um and again there's so many different takes i think cassie uh, robinson herself kind of came up with a number of different sort of interpretation life centered design um what a planet centric design and the concept of ter terrestrials there are so many of different takes on generally just these just this need that we all have to kind of do something because we see that things are not as 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 good so anything that can help us kind of meeting this need uh, is perhaps going to be sort of good for social uh, good social design in a way great and thank you also for saying that because there is a bit of a spoiler of what will happen later um thank you matteo for giving giving uh sharing with us all your thoughts and uh your experience um we're gonna move to the next speaker that is gita uh, i'm gonna share my screen just to so that you can sort of um uh visual of her name and the talk that she's gonna give us. So Gita Luz is the an innovation lead at Action for Children. And today she's gonna talk about a personal project and how she kind of uh, find her own ways to, to get this project and her personal experience. And I'm gonna pass it over to you, Gita. Hi everyone, I'm Gita. Uh, I'm here to talk about a personal project um, that I ran um uh which i'll talk a bit more about um but 
yeah, uh, just as a quick intro to me. So, uh, Gita, I'm the Innovation Development Lead at Action for Children, which is a UK children's charity. Uh, we've been around for 150 years, um, and we uh, run kind of children's services all across the UK. Um, I am a new parent to a human who I can hear in the background is crying right now, and my husband is dealing with it. Uh, so I'm going to have to check in in a bit. Um, but yeah, so Milo, he's like a year old um, and he's just lived his life through this pandemic, but has no clue, which is good for him. Um, and just, yeah, my motto is kind of impatience is a virtue. I don't know how you guys are feeling, but I think the pandemic and then having a child and then, you know, kind of the climate crisis and all of that, it just feels like incremental just isn't enough. So I think that's one of the things that's, that's driving me uh, at the moment. Um, so I was wondering if we could do like a quick exercise um, in the chat box. Um, but it'd be really interesting to see like, how do you guys feel when faced with a social issue that you're passionate about? Um, so if we just take like, you know, five seconds uh, to type up around that. Um, unfortunately, I can't figure out how to see the chat box until maybe I'm out of present mode, but I will look at that in a bit. Um, but yeah, um, I think on my end, when I, I guess it's a mix, right? I think, I think when I started, so, so I, I used to work, um, I used to work in advertising um, and I used to work in the CSR department of that, which, which was great because we kind of worked on like cause related stuff and all of that. And it was very exciting. And I think I felt very passionate about kind of making a difference. And then sometimes you're like, well, I'm still working in kind of a very corporate space and maybe this is, and again, this is what kind of Matteo was saying about it. it. It starts becoming all a bit gray about there's no good industry or bad industry. Um, but if it's like, I want to get out and kind of make direct impact. Uh, so I joined the Red Cross um, and now at Action for Children. But I guess what I'm saying in a long-winded way is sometimes, you know, you feel really passionate about a social issue um, and want to do something. But I feel like in the age of like, I don't know, Trump, Brexit, uh, you know, global warming, uh, climate crisis. I also feel like a bit like helpless, like I'm just one person. So I think, you know, kind of where I was coming from was, you know, especially when, when coronavirus hit, I'm one person, I'm actually on maternity leave, so I'm not even attached to the, the place where I work, where I could maybe do something. Um, what the hell can I do? So this is, this is a photo of me and Milo. Uh, we were actually in the Philippines when lockdown happened. Um, and lockdown happened there. We were on holiday and then lockdown happened very, very quickly. And we had to rebook our tickets very, very quickly so that we could come back to London. Um, and it, it happened so quickly that my husband who was in London was who was meant to come back, pick us up. We were going to have a fun holiday and then we'd go home. Had none of no time for that. I just had to kind of pack up really quickly, fly in two days and go. And it was such a stark experience to, to see what lockdown meant for real across two countries as well. So kind of in Manila and in London and kind of the, the kind of the fear, the panic around all of that, having to say goodbye to family without knowing when I'd see them next or when they'd see Milo next. Um, and, and yeah, then looking at his face and look at that picture, there's no clue what's going on. Um, so lucky him. Um, but that kind of led me to try and think of, you know, I, I'm not working at Action for Children at the moment. What what can I do? Like, I felt so helpless, um, but I felt like I had to do something. So I, hopefully this speaks to you guys of, you know, maybe social impact isn't your day job. Um, it was mine, but it, I wasn't in a space to do something about it. But I, I felt like I can share some stories on how I found, you know, something that I could personally do that I found, you know, um, very fulfilling. So the personal project is a book called Q is for Quarantine. Um, so I'll talk a bit more about how I came up with the idea, but basically it's a fully illustrated uh, A to Z kids book um, with a lot of kind of like practical like uh, lessons, like what is testing and what is social distancing, but also kind of like maybe the more uh, hopeful things that we're, we're learning uh, in this experience, like joy and kind of wonder and, you know, appreciating nature and, and stuff like that. Um, so I just want to quickly share kind of five five things I learned from, from doing this project. Um, and I guess, again, from the start, I'm kind of, what can I actually do? Um, because yeah, I, even Milo is a full-time job. Um, 
So I think the first thing I learned was just kind of like finding, finding that sweet spot of kind of what you're good at or passionate about. Um, and also like where the greatest need is. So I just, I knew that, I guess the sweet spot for me was that, you know, I, I have this kid who is just going to have zero memory of what's going on. I feel like we're learning lessons that we should hold on to. And I don't want this to revert back to that, you know, sense of what is normal when actually we should challenge a lot of that. Um, and, and also like, I'm just living the experience of being a first time parent and trying to navigate this. And I'm trying to think like, I wonder how other parents and other kids are trying to explain, especially to kids who are older and, and need a bit more kind of explanation of what's going on. So that kind of felt like that was the sweet spot of, this is my personal experience. And also this feels like a great need because I was hearing from kind of fellow parents, especially of older kids, like, you know, I don't know how to explain to them that we can't go out for like a while or why we can't see, you know, um, grandma and grandpa and stuff like that. So, so again, I think, especially if social impact isn't like your day job, there's definitely something that you can still find that takes the essence of you and combines it with, with where the greatest need is. Um, I guess the other thing I learned was that ideas can come at the most random times. So I think in that sense, kind of, if you know, you know, what, what you're good at, what you're about, plus where the greatest need is, kind of keep yourself open and, and see where, where ideas come and what should I, and then the question of what should I do with them is just do something, anything. So, I mean, this might be oversharing, but basically I had the idea about this book when I was breastfeeding Milo because breastfeeding takes a long, long time. So you've got a lot of time where you're just sitting down and thinking. So this idea came up uh, and the idea was, what if I make, this book and now because also I mean I'm not I'm not a children's book writer I'm not an illustrator so how can I get this thing off the ground so while I was feeding Milo I quickly made this post on Facebook and said you know I want to make this book um, for these reasons uh, what words or phrases do you suggest you know I, I use for each of the letters um, and and if any illustrators want to take this up um, please reach out you know I was like, if I get this off the ground, um, I'll print it and I'll raise money for frontline workers. Um, and then I had this, you know, this photo of me and Milo and I just kind of put Q is for quarantine. Um, and yeah, I got loads of comments, um, loads, loads of kind of like likes and, and pieces of encouragement. So I guess the thing I learned there is kind of share unfinished ideas and see if anyone bites. Um, I guess this fits really well with kind of my background as the day job of kind of innovation, but I, I really think it's, it's a great way to get kind of quick feedback. And this is a great way to, to feel out with my network if, if people were, were keen on the idea. Um, and I think just start something, like even if you don't know, and I did it when we started, how we were gonna fund it, if we'd get enough you know, illustrators to volunteer or if we'd be able to finish the book, how it, how it would work or if we could even pull it off. So I basically just kind of made like these graphics on Canva and then once we got an, a designer on board, they made a mock-up of what the book could look like. And that was pretty much every, everything we needed just to get the ball rolling. Um, so that was a nice, nice lesson there. Um, and again, like I said, none of my friends or myself are children's book illustrators or writers. Uh, but I mentioned my past life in advertising, uh, which brings me to the third kind of lesson of um, work your networks. So for anyone who's ever worked in advertising and marketing, you'll know that it's actually filled with artistic souls, but who are kind of enslaved in the corporate world. Um, so actually, they're full of copywriters and designers who actually want to work on stuff like children's books. Um, so we did a call out of, you know, we wanted volunteer illustrators and yeah, um, a whole load of people came out of the woodworks. Um, I guess I should mention while I put this idea out there, I ended up attracting a core group of people who I used to work with in my advertising days who were so taken by this idea that they wanted to help me. So we formed the kind of the core group and they were the ones who helped me kind of reach out and find illustrators. We actually got more than 26 applicants so we really had to kind of screen them which again was a good sign that you know this idea has legs and also I think like work your networks so I don't know if you guys know Gemma Corral um, if you look her up on Instagram she's got great comics especially around the pandemic 
Um, and yeah, working your networks is just like, I'm a fan. I'm just going to ask her. Maybe she would like to join us. Plus, we need some, a big hitter for, you know, C for coronavirus. So I just messaged her on Instagram. Um, and she really, really quickly replied to the point where I was a bit shocked. And I kind of had to kind of fangirl message back and be like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. We'll send you the brief. Um, so it, it's great. I think that was just, again, such a confidence boost for us as a group that like, look, this idea, it can go somewhere because someone who's like a real legit illustrator um, is happy to donate her time as well because all the illustrators kind of donated their works to us. Um, so that was great. And then, so, I mean, it's amazing. This idea has legs, people are excited, but again, how am I gonna pull this off? Because we're in two different time zones, 30 people, five different countries, and, and we're all in lockdown around the world. Um, and these are people I've never met before. So I think the fourth lesson there was just kind of, again, remembering the people behind all of this. So it's a great product, but actually it's, it's the people behind it that made it happen. So kind of building a community was, was a core thing that, that we did. So I mentioned we had a core group uh, of, of friends. Uh, there are five of us who were working on this. So one writer, one, uh, one designer, um, or two designers and illustrators and, and someone helping us with the testing and marketing. Um, but see, this is the thing. I'm almost like, what I learned from this is that it was so much easier and faster to get this off the ground than anything I've ever done at work. Um, and we didn't have any of the processes of like having defined roles and a racy matrix and who's responsible, who's whatever. We just had a lot of constant and open communications. We used Facebook Messenger and that was the easiest thing and we'd just tag and, and like each other's posts and and because we were working across time zones, we just pick things up when someone was awake, that type of thing. But it just, I mean, obviously most of us were friends from before, so that really helped smooth things out. But it, it kind of made me think that, you know, you can have all the role definitions in the world, but if, if you don't trust each other and don't have open communications, it's, it's not gonna work. Um, another great thing we did was when we finally recruited all the artists, for the ones who could make it, we had a kickoff call on Zoom where we talked about the brief and we had a, a Google kind of slide deck on the brief and you know the font to use and the color palette and all of that. Actually, we spent a really uh, big chunk of the time also talking about how we were all feeling because we felt it was important to check in because we knew that everyone was going through that same scary experience of lockdown um, and that we wanted to make sure that our artists were okay and that they use that um, positive energy about bringing a community together across you know, the world. Artists locked down all over the world, kind of contributing and, and being able to find that positive space. And then just really quickly, again, how did we fund it? We ended up crowdfunding. So we kind of built a community that wanted to back us even before we had a finished product. Um, and of course, the most important bit, it's for the parents and the kids so what we, would, what we did was we tested very early drafts of the book and illustrations and improved things with feedback. So kind of, again, it was all built by, by a crowd, really. Um, and then lastly, I think, and Matteo uh, touched on this, I think be hopeful because I think I just got it in my head that I can definitely publish a book and get 30 people to help me out and find the money somehow and figure out like global shipping and whatever. Um, but yeah, it is really hard and it can feel really intimidating. So I think where you can just kind of celebrate success. Um, so, you know, when when we hit like, you know, above and beyond our, our stretch target, um, or this is a mural board of all the artwork from like first draft to final. And just to really see that progression was, was a great reminder that, you know, we did something pretty fucking amazing. Um, so yeah, so I guess that's, that's me, um, and so I'll stop sharing there and see if anyone has kind of any questions. Great, thank you, Gita. I feel really energized by this positive presentation and the positivity of your experience. And thank you for like sharing all your practical tips and uh, you know on what you can do actually from an idea to practically get 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 it done, as well as um, you know, all, how you like, you start from scratch to having all these people joining you in this project and contacting your favorite illustrator and so on. So it was, it was great to see, to see this journey and how, how it evolved. 
Um, I don't know if there are other, if there is any, any question. Um, I've got I, a quick I, question actually yeah, for Gisa. Sure. Gisa, thanks so much. That's so fantastic. Um, would you take on a project like this again? And if you did, what would you do differently? Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, again, just because it was such a good way to focus, not just my energy, but a bunch of people who were feeling the exact same way of feeling really helpless, overwhelmed, scared. Um, so for that reason, I can see that it brought a lot of joy to people, the ones making it and also like the ones who are now on the receiving end. And, you know, we get pictures sent to us of people reading the books of their children. And, and that's, that's great. I mean, ironically, I have never seen the book because it's being printed in the Philippines and we're still, we've got so many orders, we have to print again. So yeah, I've never actually seen it. Um, so I think how I do things differently. Um, I think maybe I'd spend a bit more time kind of just researching like three or four steps ahead. I think like, because it's become so popular we're doing you know we've printed 500 books but i'm now trying to figure out things like how to make an ebook or how to do like global distribution and all of that um i mean those are really nice problems to have um and it's really made me and how to find a literary agent because i've never thought about that before but it's made me have to research all these things that i don't know a whole lot about so i think in future i might like sound out more and say like hey if this really works um can anyone help me in this or that um, so kind of just amplifying that like wisdom of the crowd effect because I know I can't do this by myself. Thanks. I can't wait to see Milo reading it in the future. That's going to be such a lovely moment. Yeah, that'll be great. So the last speaker today, here we have Araceli Camargo, that is the lab director at the Centric Lab, and um, is going to talk about an anti-racist approach to city design. So my name is Araceli, and I am a neuroscientist, and I am the head of Centric Lab, which is a neuroscience lab dedicated to improving urban health. So I am not a designer. Um, we work within um, the city, so we usually work at a planning level and or with developers, but we also work with communities and, um, and helping them out, understanding how their health is being affected by things like air pollution, um, um, the lack of biodiversity, and, and we also work with uh, nonprofits, um, organizations that are looking to improve um, people's health. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about an anti-racist uh, framework. So first, let's start with understanding what structural racism looks like. So the slide that you're seeing um, at the moment, um, the is from a study that we did April, May um, about COVID and BAME communities. So the reason we went ahead and did this study, um, we actually did, we funded it ourselves and did it off our own back was because we did realize um, that people were going to be gaslit, specifically BAME communities were going to be gaslit as to why they were getting sick. Um, and we looked at, at we, we have a software system that allows us to see both where are the areas of high deprivation in London, but also what, um, what are the areas that have higher levels of concentration of environmental stressors. So that's air pollution, noise pollution, light pollution, um, and thermal. And we, before the pandemic, um, uh, even started to evolve, we had already created a hypothesis that the people that were going to be the most hit were going to be people that were going to be living in these areas and the areas where those two, that, that two, what do you call it, two phenomena were, were colliding. And that's something that we call biological inequality. It's a term that we coined um, to describe the experience of both high levels of environmental stressors and also high levels of stressors from the experience of poverty. Um, you can check out the paper to understand how that dynamic makes people more biologically susceptible to disease. Um, uh, I won't get into that right now. Um, but <clears throat> what I want to make, uh, make you aware is that when we started doing the data, there's one thing to know about structural racism conceptually um, or even personally, but when you see it in a data structure, 
you really begin to see the injustice. And I, and I don't mean begin to see because you don't see it in any other way, but there's something really infuriating about having cold data point to you that there is a force at play that people can't control. And um, so the, the, the image on the left-hand side, um, yeah, your left-hand side, um, is structural racism. So the way that we measure that, it was where Bain populations lived, as well as where they were high levels of uh, deprivation and high levels of stress, where they coalesced. And if you look at the map on the right, that's a map of where COVID hit. And so if you just compare and contrast side by side, you can see that the areas where there is high BAME, high deprivation, high environmental stressors are also the areas where they are high levels of COVID, both as we predicted, but also we can now see it as, as a system. So how do we get there? How do you how do you end up with an entire city um, in a system where um, you have structural racism working at such a poignant uh, or sorry having such a poignant role in a person's in a person's health? Um, this is where I can insert a little bit of of design, and in it, in, in it's something that I guess I, I would throw back to you guys as a design community, but. It comes in, first of all, who do we decide as a society doesn't matter? And we can't hide away from that. There are people that we have decided because of their color of their skin, their religion, their sexuality, whatever other it is that we put, they don't matter. They don't matter as much. They are indispensable. And we allow ourselves for that to be okay. There's just no other way around it. There's no other way to put it. That is what's happening. And when we decide that those people don't matter, we ignore them. You know, so for example, when we're looking at workers and worker health, it's usually for workers that are CEOs, upper management. No, excuse my language, but nobody gives a fuck about designing something nice for a bus driver or designing a better... Um, worker experience for a janitor. No one ever talks about that. Um, and it goes back to who is invisible, who do we care about? And so when you're looking at this from a planning perspective, they make certain adjustments in, in city design, whether it's where are we going to put the playground? For who is this playground going to be? For. Um, where are we going to put the park? Who's going to be able to access the park? Um, and again, it goes to the people that matter the most. Um, it goes to the people that can then afford to actually access the design, which is something that very rarely gets talked about. Who can afford your designs? Who can afford your interventions? Not just on a time perspective, but on a social perspective, on a psychological perspective, on a time perspective. Who, who affords the interaction with the things that you're designing. So we get there through, quite frankly, not caring. We get there through apathy. We get there through not seeing things beyond the end of our noses. Um, that's how we get to where we are. So anti-racism um, and technically also anti-classes is what we focus on in our lab um, where, um, mainly our work is concentrated. And the reason that our work is concentrated in that is because we have to look out for the people that society has made the most vulnerable. Um, and we also have run out of time um, in terms of climate change being at our, not even at our doorstep, it's here, we're living it. Um, and with climate change, we're going to get more upheaval in terms of society, which is going to create more inequality. Certainly COVID is also going to create more inequality and it has already created more inequality, or I should even say inequity. Um, and therefore the problems that are complex and also simultaneous uh, complex problems are going to be our new norm. Um, so I'm from the United States 
and ha- you know the west side of our of, of the United States is on fire and on the east coast we have hurricanes we can't afford to just have input output solutions when we're facing ecological based problems um, so the anti-racist work comes from being framed on an ecological perspective so that's what we look at. So an ecological view on health is actually what makes it anti-racist, anti-classist, because a lot of the times, even when it comes to health design, um, you get things like, oh, well, how are we going to create nudges for people? And I was reading on Twitter, this lady that was saying, you know, I am so sick and tired of the work or well-being design at work, you know, where we're going to introduce yoga and we're going to introduce a new cafeteria and we're going to give you plants. And then she's like, I don't care about any of that. How about you give me a raise so I can go home and have a better life and not stress about my finances? How about you know, I don't have to commute for two hours. Um, and that, you know, the time that I that I waste in commuting, I get to spend with my family. And that makes a lot of sense as far as I can see is that that's her world and that that e- that is the ecological world of looking at a problem is that you're not just looking at the quick fix or you're not just looking at that linear pathway because it's easy because it's comforting or it's comfortable um, and and that's why we want to look at ecological health um, also because it's the moral thing to do. Um, It really pisses me off when I hear things like, oh, so um, to solve obesity, let's let's create adverts that promote the five a day um, and or how do we get people to eat more fruit and veg or um, how, you know, how do we, how do we move people like even from a high street perspective? um, So they are, So they are going to the fruit and veg stand versus going to the chippy shop. Well, I I always tell, you know, designers or people at this level that I'm like, well, we all eat junk food. That's not the reason people are obese. People are obese because um, the environments that they're living in causes them to have trauma and high stress and PTSD, which changes your metabolical functions. People have obesity because they are working um, two jobs or doing shift work, which also changes their metabolical function. And people have obesity because there's air pollution that they are ingesting all day at a higher proportionate level than people that are well healthier or wider, um, that's why they have obesity. And if we're only targeting how many apples are having a day, we're not going to get to the bottom of the problem. We're going to do nothing. And worse, we blame them for not having the five apples a day or whatever it is that we're instructing them to have without giving them the proper ecological infrastructure for their health. Um, and that's immoral. That's incor- That's an incorrect um, thing to do. Technically, you're gaslighting that community, right? Because you're telling them, if you have the five a day, you're going to lose weight, you're going to, uh, and you're going to be healthier. But obesity isn't about just being overweight. That's such a small part of it. It's the fact that your body no longer metabolizes things correctly. So even if you are eating fruit and vegetables, it might end up... St- being bad for you in terms of then diabetes because obesity and diabetes are incredibly uh correlated so but we don't talk about that we don't discuss that we don't want to get into into that level of the problem and so the problem ensues um so then that brings us to do i think do i have one more slide oh no that is actually that is the end of my slide so then what do we what do we go from 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 here like what what are the I would say the principles, because it's not it's not a question of rules um, or following guidelines or anything like that. It's 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 a set of principles. So the first thing is that we've got to start looking at communities. So um, I know that I said BAME, but what does BAME even mean? Like it's part ethnicity, it's part nationalities, and really it's a nondescript um, uh, way of of looking at people, and if we're saying that health has an ecological basis, that means that it's not bane that makes you sick. It is the environment and the habitat and that what you have around you that makes you sick. So that's what we have to tackle. And um, also, sorry, side note: the reason I'm also focusing on health is because we're at a precipice, people like. 
I like who gives a shit about designing about anything else except for health. We have to have a healthy planet. We have to have healthy people because as COVID has showed, we don't have anything if we don't have health. So that's the whole, I guess, focus on health. Um, um, so, okay. So what do we do? So once we get down to the community level, the next thing is to really understand the lived experience of, of people. I heard empathy um, uh, being thrown around, but it has to be beyond just empathy. Um, it has to be asking the right questions. It has to be um, inserting yourself or better yet being invited into that community to say, yeah, be one of us, be part of us. Um, so you can really... Um, do the work with us. So when we do work with communities, there is a community leader. We are not the leaders. We do not insert ourselves. That is not our story. It is not about us. It is completely about them and how maybe the science that we do allows them to tell their story in an organized way to, or in another way of, sorry, in another organized manner that is translatable to the people that they then have to go and speak to. Um, and that's incredibly important to understand the lived experience because you, you begin to learn the nuances of why things happen the way they do. And you begin to understand the full ecological, so i.e. the full habitat of how things are moving um, and changing within a community. Um, two, it's understanding the unintended human consequence. Again, if you're just going linearly, you're not understanding then peripherally what's happening on either side of the solution. So for example, if I say I'm tired, you design a chair, but sedentary behavior then gives me, puts me on a pathway to diabetes, obesity, depression, anxiety. So we got to look beyond the chair. So having empathy would just tell you, Oh, well, I'm just going to build a chair for you because you said you were tired. Allowing yourself to fully immerse yourself in the community would begin to ask more complex questions or more sophisticated questions such as why are you tired is it because you're of age is it because you have osteoporosis is it because um maybe actually you're not tired you're actually more on the fatigue side because you're a shift worker and your 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 metabolical system is completely out of whack you, you, we have to start looking at that because otherwise we won't see the peripheral. We won't see the unintended consequences of, of the solutions that we push, push forward. The, and the next thing is, and this is related to planet, is understanding supply chains. Um, you know, there was a, there's a really cool climate scientist who is equally as grumpy as I am. And he said the other day, you know, again, fuck plastic. And I thought, yeah, we, we can't, use plastic and there were people that chimed in and like oh but people that are disabled they have to use plastic and i'm diabetic and i have to use plastic we can do better than that we can design better than that than being dependent on plastic 100 percent. and also you know we can't we can't afford that loophole uh, sorry we can't uh, afford that loop back again where we are ingesting plastic plastic is now in our blood and our gut and the air that we breathe it's everywhere um but it was interesting in the way that people still couldn't make that switch because they're like, oh, but, but, but some of us need it. And I'm like, not in 2020. We can do better. We can, we can design things in a much more intelligent way where we're not just doing things for us as humans, but we're also paying attention how we save the rest of the planet because what's the point in saving us if we're not saving the planet? Um, so we have to think about the supply chains. Where's your materiality coming from? Is your materiality... Um, causing the need to create extraction. And if it's creating extraction, what's it doing to those habitats? What's it doing to the health of the humans in those habitats of where you're, you're getting your resources for the solution that you're creating? Um, and then understanding who is the most vulnerable, even if you are looking at helping a community, for example, in our case, that is suffering disproportionate levels of air pollution, we still have to look there, who are the most vulnerable and why have that been made vulnerable? Because people aren't just vulnerable for the sake of vulnerability. They're vulnerable because we've made them vulnerable, because the system has made them vulnerable. So we have to understand who's the most vulnerable and why. And that's where the 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 starting point of the solution has to be concentrated because if we if we make it better for them, it really is making it better for everybody. So for example, buildings when before they didn't have ramps and then ramps became a, a uh, international requisite um, by the UN, 
it's good for everybody. It's good for me if I'm too tired to go up the stairs. It's, it's good if I ended up breaking my leg and now I need to use the ramp. It's good for the elderly person and it's good for the, for the person with mobility issues um, who that was originally intended for. It's also good for delivery drivers. It's a lot easier for them to go up a ramp than going up a, a staircase. So going to the most vulnerable and taking actually the vulnerability from the built environment, um, we not, we've not only elevated them and we have allowed the space to be more equitable, but we've also elevated it for everybody else. Um, and then the final point is understanding the problem that is being solved and also understand the solutions that you put to that problem are going to create more problems. It's just, I guess you can call that a fact, right? So as I said, someone's tired, you offer them a chair, but then they can't spend all that time in the chair because the chair changes everything. I mean, it even changes the way that you digest because of the posturing, right? So we, we have to understand that every problem, sorry, every solution is also going to cause another problem. Um, and the final uh, bit that I'm going to say is just a, case, a quick case study from the city perspective and design is um, at the moment, everyone's been really cheery and happy about um, low traffic neighborhoods. So they're called LTNs and um, my timeline is filled with all these designers that are beside themselves because they put a planter on a street and um, that street no longer has cars and somehow that also equates to low air pollution. Firstly, it doesn't because if the cars are being diverted one street over, their particles are going to go to that street anyway. So you haven't really solved the air pollution problem. But two, no one has bothered asking the vulnerable people in those roads that they have made low traffic neighborhoods, if that's okay, because who can ride bicycles? You have to be really abled. And even amongst those of us that are abled, I can't ride it if I have a fever. I can't ride a bicycle if I have a fever. I can't ride a bicycle if I'm incredibly tired. Um, you have to be in a very specific abled position to ride a bike. Now I'm not saying not have them, of course, it's good to start introducing those things, but what are we going to do about the elderly person? What are we going to be, what are we going to do about the child with autism? How are they going to ride a bike or the, or the, or someone who um, has to, has an hour or more commute and maybe they, um, they are a nurse. We were going to expect a nurse to do a 12 hour shift and then ride a bicycle for an hour. What happens if you don't feel safe because maybe the hours that you work don't allow you for it. And if we just change the neighborhood like that from one day to the next, and we introduce this foreign thing that changes a lot of dynamics and we don't understand how, how, what those dynamics have been that changed, we've done something wrong. And we haven't done the job properly, but no one seems to have that level of patience or dare I even say empathy to understand what are those ripple effects. Everyone's just clapping themselves on the, you know, what is that thing? Patting themselves on the back over introducing these neighborhoods. And I'm not saying they shouldn't exist, but they can't exist when we have a society that's incredibly unequal because we then just create more inequality through things like this. Um, and so um, we have to ensure that, again, when we're talking about that unintended consequence, is that we're not just introducing more inequality, that we're not excluding an entire group of people, because once you start excluding, then you are um, becoming racist or ableist or, you know, even homophobic and transphobic spaces can be all of that, because if they don't give the signs or the affordability for everyone to join in, then you are being discriminatory, whatever, or whatever it is that you design is being discriminatory to somebody. And, and that's our work. Our work is to ensure, like I said, um, that everyone has health and that everyone has health through the different affordances that the, that the built environment um, has allowed them to have. Okay, rant over. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Araceli, for your passion and presentation, for sharing your experience and views and all the different like layers. 
um, there's been also some comment coming through about like agreeing with kind of like going to the root of the cause and uh, there's been like, agreement on all different aspects of, of what you were saying. Um, it was great, thank you so much. Um, I'm also uh, aware of time that we've been spending here already an hour and a half. Um, so thank you again to you and to all the other speakers. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Charlie. Thanks again, I tell you that was fantastic. There were lots of claps going across. Um, do shout or put into the um, chat if there are any quick questions. I'll just pause for a sec before we wrap up. Okay. I'm sure if you do come up with any questions, I'm sure you can uh, contact Aracelli online um, and further pick her brains. So, um, just before we wrap up, we want to say a massive thank you again and a big round of applause to all of our fantastic speakers. Thank you for everyone for giving up an hour and a half of your time. Hopefully you found it uh, really interesting um, and useful. I definitely think there's some really good tips and tricks in there for how to be designing uh, more so for more social good, but also a kind of a systemic level. So we just want to make sure that we take a sec to gather any feedback uh, from anyone. We've got some people that are new joiners to Service Lab London. We've got people that have been uh, coming for kind of five years. If you've ever got any ideas on how we can improve, please do direct message us. We're always keen to learn, always key to um, change it up. Um, and also our next Service Lab event is all about designing in a pandemic. It's on Wednesday, the 21st of October. If you have an idea of someone in mind who you think would be fantastic for this, please do reach out. Or if you yourself think you've got something you'd really like to share with the Service Lab community, we'd love to hear from you. All right, thanks so much. Hope to see you again soon.